much to the delight of the London Economist, structural reform. Lee says that structural reform is the biggest dividend for China. Uh, he wants to liberalize interest rates, raise utility prices, uh, and so forth. So you get the idea. Uh, it's called, in this article, the pain caucus, that Mr. Xi, the princeling Xi, is a neoliberal pain monger, similar in some ways to the neoliberals here in the West, right? Like the Tea Party, the people who demand more austerity. Now, maybe, maybe the maybe the right wing Marxist is not so far uh, away. Uh, you got to have stimulus. Uh, you, in other words, in a in a dirigistic system like China, which works well if you understand what it is, it's based on. The Taiwan experience under Chiang Kai-shek, it's based on MITI, Ministry of International Trade and Industry of Japan. It is dirigistic, protectionistic, um, cameralistic even, uh, to cite a very old word for this kind of stuff. Right? This is like, sort of Leibnizian, Benjamin Franklin uh, economics. So this is now the problem. Here's who is coming to see us. Now, the problem then is that it's, an, it's not a legitimate government. And so what do they do? They stir the pot of conflict. In other words, they seek to export the tensions by, for example, building this stuff in the South China Sea. Now, you can build what you want, but when you go to the South China Sea and you say, guess what? This is now our security area. This is now Chinese waters. Well, no, you can't do that. And uh, that's a very serious problem. I'm thinking... There's a very interesting passage from General de Gaulle of France when he says, why is it that the Soviets are always so turbulent and making trouble? Well, it's because they don't have that much legitimacy on the home front. And I'm afraid we see the same thing here. The sort of formally illegitimate Xi government, and, and it's paying the price now that the stock market has fallen the economy is slowing up. Nobody believes their statistics. They claim 7% growth. It might be 5 It might be 4 We just don't know. Um, so what do they do to compensate? They say, guess what? The South China Sea belongs to us. We're going to build these uh, islands, right? Uh, that's nothing so special, right? Lots of Western countries have built islands for oil drilling purposes and stuff like that, right? We built them in the Chesapeake Bay here more than 50 years ago. So there's nothing so special about that. But you get the idea. Uh, she is feeling the heat and he's uh, becoming belligerent in the international realm. These will be China, South Korea, Vietnam, all these other places who are lining up against him. So there it is. It's not a good situation. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. We got to rush because we got to give a commentary on the statements of His Holiness Pope Francis the First here in Washington D.C. We've essentially got the White House welcoming statement on uh, Wednesday. We've then got the address to the joint session of the U.S. Congress on September 24th. If you had been subscribed to the Tax Wall Street Party morning briefing, you'd have both of those. So here's the idea. Broadly speaking, we offer critical support. We support the Pope, but we have criticisms on a couple of points. But we are here to defend the Holy See and the Pontiff against scurrilous attacks, unbelievably filthy, obscene, vile attacks coming from the libertarians and even coming from uh, foreigners working in the laboring in the uh, in the what in the libertarian uh, vineyard, if that it is. Uh, uh, spewing hatred, absolute monstrosity. This guy's not happy with what the Pope doesn't say about abortion. He, he's got some kind of xenophobic anti-immigrant trip going on. He wants to be cruel to refugees. Uh, I would say to that guy, why don't you get busy with pig gate and put your own damn house in order before you come meddling over here? Now, uh, the, the obvious point of, uh, of disagreement is at the White House, the Pope says... Uh, it seems to me that climate change is a problem which can no longer be left to a future generation because this is the care of our common home. We're at a critical period of history. We have to make the changes needed to bring about a sustainable and integral development for we know that things can change. Laudato si. Well, of course, that's Malthusianism. The Pope calls for a dialogue. We want to have a dialogue. And our dialogue is that this is a terrible mistake. We think we know how it came about. It's Schnellenhuber coming from Merkel, 
essentially saying, if you want to keep getting the German church tax, you better come out in favor of this stuff. Uh, there are currents in the church, the Franciscans in particular, the Mater Terra group going back to the 1980s had this uh, as an idea. Uh, and of course, Merkel wants it because her energy costs are sky high because of the terrible, idiotic German energy uh, policy. And she wants everybody else to be in the same boat. Misery loves uh, company. So Malthus, uh, Malthusianism is a translation of Gian Maria Ortes, who was a defrocked uh, abbe at Venice in the late 1700s. He talked about a carrying capacity for the earth is, is a representative of pessimism. And it used to be that Catholics would uh, point out that uh, that kind of pessimism is inadmissible. And I, I agree that it, it, that it is. Uh, the church knows very well what the medieval warm period was because the church lived through the medieval warm period, 1000 uh, to 1200 AD. It was hotter then than it is now. And this is a result of solar activity. So with all due respect, the Pope is wrong uh, on this. I'm also shocked to hear the Pope talk about pragmatism. Um, that's, I can't imagine a Pope embracing pragmatism. Uh, pragmatism means it doesn't matter what you believe or why you do it. All that matters is what comes out. This is uh, Charles Peirce, written Pierce here in the U.S., William James. William James was the inspiration of Mussolini. Mussolini said so. And, of course, Nietzsche. Because Nietzsche says you can you can make up any myth you want and you believe in that, uh, then it's going to be okay if that's what it takes to get going in the morning. So how can the leader of the universal church, who's concerned with matters of faith, say pragmatism? I think he means cooperation, of course, to be conciliatory, yes. Now, of course, does this mean that this is around our necks forever? Well, as I point out in one of my recent articles, the Syllabus of Errors by Pius IX which was a condemnation of virtually every component of the modern world, um, came out in 1864, uh, and it became a tremendous embarrassment, a block to doing anything. Uh, it was then uh, Leo XIII who uh, corrected this with his own encyclical Libertas in 1888, which essentially overturned the entire thing. And we could do it faster. So erroneous and uh, obsolete encyclicals can be and are essentially repealed by uh, others. And I would urge this pope to repeal his own, right? He could come out and say, you know, I was, uh, I was put under uh, duress. You also may remember the question, the, the Roman question, right? La questione romana about the papal states. Uh, remember that, that, that popes like uh, Pius IX and then Leo XIII and so forth were constrained to live within this situation where the Italian state, Garibaldi and, and so forth, had taken over most of the former states of the church, right? The pontifical uh, states, um, papal states. Um, and they kept complaining about this. But it turns out, of course, that that was a terrible disadvantage to have those states. They were run by San Fedisti, right? You have the mafia in Sicily, the Indrangheta in Calabria, the Camorra in Naples, and in the papal states, you had the San Fedisti. And that's how the place was governed. This was a, a terrible scandal completely unstable, always needed foreign troops, French troops, whatever it was. So uh, that uh, didn't uh, work. Uh, but it, it took a while for the, the Vatican bureaucracy made up of fallible, frail human beings to, to realize that that was so. The other thing is capitalism. Well, there are two kinds. There's finance capital. That is exactly the source of the horrors that the Pope is talking about. But then there's industrial capitalism, which actually has served the world remarkably well in those relatively brief instances where it was uh, where it was tried out. I also I'm I'm disappointed that the Pope didn't talk about a Wall Street sales tax because he supports it. When the Pontifical Commission Justitia et Pax under Cardinal Turkson put out a statement just before the current Pope came into office. Um, there was a, a question of a Robin Hood tax or a turnover tax, a financial transfer tax, what we here call a Tobin tax or a Wall Street sales tax. He could have proposed that to the uh, U.S. Uh, conference, uh, Congress, right? That's, that's precisely what they're, they're supposed to do. Now, the good things are too good to, to mention. Let me just start off by saying 
that he uh, outweighed his, his positive points outweigh these negative points, I would say. Uh, the Captatio Benevolencia, winning the crowd over with the land of the free and the home of the brave. What a politician. You have to defend and preserve the dignity of your fellow citizens. Uh, he's got the Imago Viva Dei, that you're the living image of God. The fact of mentioning Moses is a way to assert patriarchy and authority against modern day authoritarianism and heteronomy. He stresses that working families are the ones who build world civilization. He wants a dialogue, right? We're giving him uh, a dialogue, uh, pluses and minuses. Um, Abraham Lincoln, absolutely. Martin Luther King, absolutely. Dorothy Day, a courageous choice, a woman who had abortions, considered a communist by the Republicans, and unfortunately, Thomas Merton, a mystic. But then again, of course, uh, the statements of the Vatican are, in Italian terminology, the subject of lotizzazione, the manuale cencelli applies. So he knows that there's a large group of mystics out there, so he's got to have something for them, and there we go with Merton. Otherwise, uh, I would urge you to study Lincoln, King, and Dorothy Day and uh, leave this other one out. He's got this nation under God with a new birth of freedom from Lincoln. He's talking about a new dark age. He reminds us that fundamentalism in any form is bad. Uh, the letter kills and the spirit gives life, says the Pope. Don't have reductionism of good and evil. There's more. There are variations in the world. But above all, stop violence in the world. Um, and of course... To imitate the hatred and violence of tyrants and murderers is the best way to take their place. This is something which you reject. Well, unfortunately, the neocons embrace it. And remember that when he says unjust structures, those are the structures of sin going back to John Paul II in Solicitudo Re Socialis at the end of the 1980s. So fraternity and solidarity. This is why the Austrians and the libertarians are climbing the wall. Unjust structures are all too apparent. We've got to have cooperation, solidarity. He warns against new global forms of slavery. A nod to 1776, the condemnation of fetishism, market fetishism, and greed. Uh, caritas, agape uh, are stressed. The United States is indeed the land of the mass movements. We have dreams, decent treatment for immigrants, assert Junipero Serra against the multiculturalists, all to the good. And we'll see you again next week on World Crisis Radio.